So welcome, William, to our little satsang. I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead with whatever you were talking about. Oh, I was just, I was talking about my mom passing, you know, and how it's been a, uh, it's been, you know, it's been rough, but uh, I've come to a, a place that, uh, you know, I've just come to a place to where I, I say that. And I was just telling uh, Richard that last night I, or yesterday, last night, whatever, that uh, I was just crying about, you know, missing her, <laughs> even though in the same way, I, I it's, it's, it's different. <laughs> it's not like there's pain, but it's not as I don't know. It's different pain now, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just changed for me. And I, I was explaining to him that I, I was thinking about it like the ocean because I hear that example a lot. He was telling me, I can't remember the person, but he explained to me, or it's, 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 the drop is the ocean or the ocean. <laughs> My mom was, uh, I was trying to ex say how I dealt with, with it was I, I tried to, because I'm listening to a lot of uh, messages or whatever, a lot of non-duality mostly you know uh, I, I listened to some of the non-duality people and it wasn't as I think listening to the Bhagavad Gita I'm sorry if I if I murder the words <laughs> that listening to the you Bhagavad Gita <laughs> <laughs> the Bhagavad Gita the, you know the yes Bhagavad Gita Bhagavad Gita Anyways, I, maybe I shouldn't try to say it, but uh, uh, just uh, that, and then listening to Swami, I don't remember his, I just know he's a Swami. He tells great stories. You told a great story about an elephant the other day. I, I uh, uh, well, yesterday, my time. Uh, I, I just like that story. I, I told, I, I believe it was you that, or the message was that, you know, there was an elephant I know, I know the, the most of the story. I, I'm pretty sure you said that they take, they can take a baby elephant and chain it up, and then as a baby, they know they, they don't they can't break the chain, and then as when the elephant gets older, they don't believe they can. This is what I took in from <laughs> that, and then the older elephant, when the elephant got old, or that the elephant used to carry a deity on its head. And then, if I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is what I remember, just the story. When the elephant was dying and old, then it broke its chains and then went and uh, died in front of the temple where it used to pick up the deity and carry it on its head. And I just thought that was a very interesting metaphor, or, I mean, maybe it was a real story, I don't know. But then there's another oh, it's, story. It's a real story. It really happened. Oh, it's not a, a metaphor. Wow. Oh, okay. no. Wow. Well, that's even uh, more touching, really. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's sad and beautiful to me. <laughs> you know? it's, it's beautiful, and it's really sad that, you know, it, uh, the dying part. But I know, I guess. It's well, the it, uh, it illustrates the passage from the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is saying that the thoughts that are in your mind at the moment of death determine your state of being in the next life. Wow. Hmm. So that elephant was a yogi, a devotional yogi, and had served many years in the temple. And because of that, now he's going to a higher planetary system way beyond the earth planets where he can be with God directly. That's the real purport of that story. Maybe I didn't bring that out in the uh, video. Maybe I ran I out of time. <laughs> and then it just seems similar, you know, maybe I missed the message or I got a, a total, <laughs> a different understanding of it. 
because I'd heard it earlier. A, you might know the story about uh, a, a washerman or a laundromat. I can't remember how the Swami said it. Uh, uh, he, he said this washerman had a donkey, right? He gathered up the laundry, put it on the donkey. And he gets to the river. You know, he said in India, they they, they wash the, the laundry on the rocks or, you know, the washerman. Yes. And I was like, wow, okay. You know, it sounds like, you know, to me, because I'm an American, that's like, you know, back when 1800 stuff, you know, doing your laundry by hand. But anyways, that's not part of the story. Uh, he gets to the river and he realized he didn't have a lead for or a thing to tie his donkey up at the river or next to the river. And he's fretting about it. You know, oh, gosh, I, I got all the laundry. I can't just, you know, go back. And I guess a wise man or a learned man or whatever, a person comes by and, and sees, you know, he says, uh, you know, what's your trouble? And he says, oh, I don't have a lead for my donkey. He says, oh, just pretend to tie him up to the tree, but make sure he sees you tying him up. So, you know this story, or am I slaughtering it so bad you don't know it? <laughs> anyway. Never heard this one. <laughs> okay. He said uh, he, uh, uh, he pretends to tie the donkey up. The donkey sees him being tied up, and so he's doing the laundry, and uh, he, he looks over. The donkey's still there, finishes the laundry, puts the laundry on the donkey, and gets ready to go. Donkey won't go. He's like, what? The donkey's not You have home. to untie him. <laughs> you have to untie him, yes. That's the story, yeah. So he's fretting about it. The guy comes back and says, oh, it's simple. Just go back and pretend to untie him. <laughs> Off he goes. So I, I thought that as a metaphor, you know, the baby elephant being chained up, the the larger elephant, you know, and the donkey, there's that, that uh, <laughs> not realizing you're, you could be free, you know, there's that you're, you're, free basically instead of being tied even though you don't realize yeah. it. Yes. Well that's the thing. You want to go ahead and explain it? <laughs> <Richard? laughs> or shall I? Well I, I think it's wonderful they have these kind of uh, metaphors that give us a chance to learn how uh, our own thoughts are what uh, binds us and confines our uh, life. Hello there, Evelyn. Hi, good morning. Hello, Evelyn. My name is Tay. Good, good evening. <laughs> good evening, good morning, whatever. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> now. <laughs> now, today good we... <laughs> we have uh, people from the Western Hemisphere so far. We have William from California. I'm in Mexico. Mexico. Uh, Evelyn is in Panama. Oh. Yeah, yeah more. I changed I change the time of the meeting because so far we hadn't had anyone <laughs> yeah. from the West, West but, Coast. But now look at you. Five what is it, 5.30 there or something? 4.30. 3.30. Aye. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think William has shown, uh, you know, kind of wonderful behavior by getting up and breaking his routine to join us. Really? Well, I'm glad to be here. I uh, I heard your message. You said nobody from Cal or not California. These the states has uh, been to the the Sunday the Sunday meetings, and I was like, I'll try to make that. So I set my Alexa, and uh, I woke up. I swear, five hundred times. <laughs> I must have missed it. My Alexa didn't go off. I must have missed it. <laughs> and then I woke up, and I'm like, Oh my God, it's three in the morning. <laughs> and I was like. And I get on and I'm like, oh, I'm probably in the wrong time because, you know, that time zone thing. But luckily, like, uh, here I am. <laughs> well, to anyway. me, that's, that's, that's huh? really encouraging, William. Uh, the uh, most important uh, attribute for a seeker is their desire for liberation. And if you're willing to break your routine like this, it says to me that desire is burning hot in you. I told you I've been, uh, oh, I, that's what I mentioned, the Bhagavad Gita. 
excuse me. <laughs> That's what, I mentioned it because of non-duality and I felt like there was, I, I hear the principles, you know, there's no one there, you know, all that, you know, that's basically, there's no one here, there's nothing, nothing to do kind of thing. And I just, I didn't feel like the whole, there was, so I, I, I thought, you know, that going back to the histories of where non-dualism started would be, you know, a nice uh, place. And whether it's right or wrong, I mean, maybe they, <laughs> I'm not one of those, oh, I got it. You said three words to me and I'm enlightened. <laughs> Unfortunately, I got a lot of, a lot of flesh to carry with me or something, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, you have to be honest about where you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is another quality of a sadhu, that he evaluates himself honestly and sincerely. So if you're still attached to things in the world, you can't claim to be on the ajatta platform, yeah. the, you know, kevala dvaita, unmixed non-duality. You have to accept the fact of where you are and then you can start from there to work towards the self-realization. Otherwise, if you try to jump up to a platform you're not qualified for, you'll just fall down again. You're talking about stories. There's this great story about a dog. <laughs> and they made a dog a king. You know, put a crown on his head put robes around him, set him on the throne, and everybody was coming and bowing, you know, and the dog was just watching it all go. And then somebody threw a bone. <laughs> and that was the end of the king act. <laughs> the, dog is, the dog's nature is to chase the bone. Yeah. So similarly, you know, we can pretend to be all self-realized and whatever. But if reality throws us a bone, are we going to jump on it? Are we going to chase it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. If so, then we're not really qualified for that highest platform. And we have to be honest about it with ourselves and with everybody else. Tonight, I, I, I waited to ask you this because I figured you would know. Uh, do you fast? Do you ever fast? It's... Oh, yeah. Whenever I I'm not know. hungry, I, I, I fast. <laughs> I don't, I was wondering, is there a, is there a, a proper way to fast? Uh, I mean, I guess that's just the easiest way to say it. Yeah. Don't eat. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're not hungry, don't eat. <laughs> it can't be that simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You see, thought... anytime we use force or anytime we make uh, an unusual effort, that creates karma. And then we have to uh, experience the result, good or bad, in the future, which means we have to exist in the future. So that keeps us trapped in samsara. This is the Bhagavad dream, right? Gita, huh? Samsara, is that the dream? Yeah, the round of birth and death. So um, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the third chapter, Krishna talks about akarma. That means actions that do not produce karma. And basically, actions performed in the mood of devotion without self-interest and as a service to God are without karma. Everything else is you know, going to make some result. So the thing is that the best way to go through life is like, take it easy. You know, and, and to not make strenuous efforts unless they're really called for, you know, like if there's some kind of an emergency or something. 
But in normal times, just take it easy, do what's natural, do what's easy. And everything that is destined will come to you. You can't avoid it. <laughs> That's right. See, the karma for this lifetime is already set. That's why astrology works. A Vedic astrology. Western astrology is junk. But Jyotish, Vedic astrology works because where karma is set at the moment of birth. Yes. This Jo Ish. Uh, Jyoti means light and Isha means the first. So the first light that comes in the baby's eyes, the first sound that comes in his ears, and so on, patterns the nervous system. And this creates the, um, the destiny, really, the fate that takes you through the life according at the moment of birth. And it's not that the stars cause what happens to us. Our own karma is the cause. Things that we did in previous lives. But the stars are like a clock with nine hands, the planets. And they show us what time it is. They show us which part of our karma is up for actualization like that. So a skilled astrologer can take one look at a chart and instantly see the whole life story of a person. It happened to me just the other day. My friend here where I'm staying wondered, you know, what is in my chart? So I said, well, I, you know, I can't spend a lot of time interpreting it because it's a lot of work, but I'll, chat, I'll cast your chart and uh, we'll just see, you know, what pops out. So I did his chart and he's got five planets in the 12th house. My God, you know. I don't know what I that mean, means. This but... just, it just jumped out at me. Well, it's a very rare stellium. And it basically means that either he attained self-realization in this life or he becomes like a wino in the street. <laughs> you know, Seriously. You say that and it's like, that's the message I've been getting. It's like, dude, this is your last term. I, I know that sounds crazy, but that's, <laughs> it's like you don't make that's it. That's not crazy. <laughs> oh man, that's, that's crazy. terrible. It, huh? would just take, it would just take a, a, a quick look at your chart to see what are your prospects for enlightenment in this lifetime. It's already baked in. You know, <laughs> I remember after going to India and making a lot of efforts to learn the Vedas and Sanskrit and stuff like this, once I realized, wow, I could have just sat in America and all of this would have come to me. <laughs> it's true, because all the teachers, especially back in the 60s and 70s, the great teachers were coming to the West and they were translating all the classics into English and like that. So, uh, you know, I, I really didn't have to go to India, but I did. <laughs> And the experience was so culturally enriching because I got to live in the Vedic culture or what's left of the Vedic culture um, and learn the Sanskrit and the scriptures and all in that atmosphere. It's like full immersion. Yeah. You know, so, of course, that's a better way to learn. And uh, it's the same way with any path of self-realization. The best way, like if you're gonna learn Zen, go to Japan, you know? If you're gonna learn Native American mysticism, 
Go to the reservation, man. That's what I mean. <laughs> That's what I'm I one. <laughs> huh? That's where my house is at. <laughs> I live on a, where? a huh? It's Smith where? River. It's a reservation in Smith River, Talawa. It's the Talawa Nation. Uh, Talawa D Nation. Very nice. Yes. My roommate's a Native American and uh so <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. I don't I'm know about saying. now. It's been a long time since I was involved. Um, back back in the days, I did a lot of ceremony with the Navajos in New Mexico, and I did the sun dance and the the stone people lodge a, a million times. And um, you know, there's nothing like actually doing the practice among. The people who is whose culture it's it's embedded in. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing like it, you know. You, there's certain things you cannot get by reading books and studying or even practicing. But when you're in the culture, like I just spent the last five years in Tiruvannamalai, and you know, in the South Indian Shaivite Advaita culture especially around the energy of Arunachala, it was total immersion. You know, I lived right across the street from a temple and starting early in the morning, you know, there were just ceremonies and offerings and kirtans and stuff like that going on. And then I would walk up on the hill or as close as I could get to it. <laughs> and um, amongst the sadhus, and, you know, it, there's just no substitute for being in the cultural environment that is the origin of your teaching. That's the way you learn it. Like when I wanted to study Buddhist teaching, I went to Thailand. I didn't find a good situation there. So I came to Sri Lanka and I spent five years in Sri Lanka as a monk, uh, living in monasteries and like that. Um, so, you know, if you're really serious, if you, if you really want to get it, you know, you, you have to choose a path. And the best way to learn the path is then to embed yourself in the culture that the path comes from. You know, if you have the option, that, that would be my choice. That was my choice. Yes. When I took philosophy, my uh, philosophy teacher said that India is the most spiritual place that he'd been. And just him telling me that, I was like, oh, that would be so, you know, amazing to feel that energy that you were describing, you know? It's like, uh, yeah. Also, like the Swami, I spent uh, eight years living in Tiruvannamalai before we came to Mexico. Wow. And, uh, I lived there long enough until I knew uh, that, to say it one way, Terravanomaly Terra Era Natula was within me. So then it didn't matter where I was. I hear that too. Yeah, <laughs> That's what they say. yeah you, you internalize the teaching by being fully immersed in the environment the cultural environment from which the teaching comes. It's just a natural thing. You absorb it by osmosis. But that's, yeah, if you're really serious about the spiritual path, that's the best way, you know, most potent way uh, to learn any path. I just want to explain why I, I move like this. Uh, I have metal in my back, so I can't bend. So <laughs> I'm just a stiff board. <laughs> so, I, I have to just tell you the truth. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes I, you know, I sit like this. And it's like I'm just uh, sitting. So. <laughs> now, we have a couple of more people who have entered the meeting. And we... Oh, who's here? We... Uh, Kumar and uh, Kailisa. Oh, 
Welcome. And, Namaste. Uh, Namaste. Uh, we kind of uh, really didn't start the meeting. We were just continuing to discuss with William. Did you have anything that you wanted to say to us uh, to start off the meeting, Swamiji? Actually, yes. I want to talk about the mystery, the holy mystery of the origins of the world. Now, you know, you've seen our chart, <laughs> the four states of consciousness, the four yogas, the four views, and the chakras that are related <coughs> to them. Uh, if you've watched any number of our videos, and so the, the way we see the world differs according to the level of consciousness, okay? Um, like when we're in dualistic consciousness, we think the body is real, we think the ego is real, we think the world is real and all the objects in it are actual. And uh, then when we move up to the next stage of uh, Dvaita, uh, then uh, we see that there's part of the reality that is non-dualistic, but we can't realize it yet. We're still caught up in the conditioned duality. So, in that stage, we worship God. In the first stage, too, we worship God. But in the bhakti stage, we actually learn to love God. And this is spontaneous. It springs from within the self. Because we see, actually, the self reflected in God and the other jivas, the other living beings. And then the world starts to look like a dream. And this is only increasing when we go to the next higher stage, the stage of Raja Yoga, Shushupti consciousness. Then we see the ultimate actually is emptiness, nothingness, that we don't see the world although we have the potential to see it. And then finally, in the highest stage, uh, this is the, the realm of jnana yoga, uh, the highest stage of consciousness, turiya, consciousness of consciousness. In that stage, we clearly see that the world doesn't, really exist, that the ego and mind, the body and the objects in the world are simply appearances. And these are two basic views on the mystery of the creation or the, the origin of the world. One is called gradual creation, which is described in many, many scriptures in the world. Uh, in our own programs on this channel, we've talked about Lakshmi Tantra. We've talked about the uh, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. And then also the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Purana. And actually many other scriptures talk about the gradual creation, which begins from Brahman. But then there is a creation of duality and the different qualities, the tattvas, and then they morph into personalities, the various demigods and so on. And so this creation happens over a vast period of time and that it exists for an even vaster period of time. And then finally at the end, it's all destroyed and wound up 
back into the supreme. So this is called gradual creation, kartritva shrishti. And the uh, gradual creation is taught in the Vedas and mostly actually in the Puranas, the histories. But the uh, Advaitins, they uh, see a different reality. They see what's called Drishti Shrishti, which means the reality or the creation is there because I see it. You know, just like in Uladu Narpadu, I know you're thinking of that, right, Richard? Because we see the world. The world exists because we see it. And, you know, you would think by now uh, that uh, people would have got the message of quantum mechanics, which is that reality is dependent on how we observe it. In other words, uh, for example, if we go looking for the uh, mass of a particle, we can't, lo we can't know its location. This is the uncertainty principle. Or if we can pinpoint the location of a particle, we can't know its mass or its energy. There's a funny story about, uh, um, what's his name? He uh, not Heidegger, Heisenberg. He's driving in his car and he gets pulled over by a cop. And the cop says, or he says, why did you pull me over, officer? And the cop says, you were going 86 miles per hour. And then Heisenberg goes, oh, no, now I don't know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to be a science geek to get it. But the point is that the reality is how we look at it. And if we look at it from the point of view of duality or with the expectation that the world is real, that's what we'll see. But when we look at it from non-duality and with no expectation, what we see is simply an appearance. And the fact that every day when we wake up in the morning, this whole reality springs into being. And then at night when we go to sleep, it fades out and it's replaced by a different reality in dreams. And finally, when we enter deep sleep, the whole thing disappears. So uh, this is the actual proof that the srishti drishti, the simultaneous creation, is uh, the ultimate truth. Now, like I was counseling William, if we don't see this, then we should admit that and not, you know, pretend. But uh, take it for the truth of where we are right now. That gives us then, the possibility to advance further. But once we understand that I am the self, I am Brahman, I am the consciousness, uh, the one being, that is all, then we start to view the world from that center. And then we see the world is just an appearance. It's temporary. It's like a dream. No, it is a dream. <laughs> it's like a mirage, you know? You go in the desert and you see what looks like water off in the distance. 
But if you go there, there's no water at all, simply dry desert. So in the same way, we see what appears to be other people, different objects, you know, stuff happening in the world and like that. But if we actually try to interact with them, they morph and disappear like phantoms, you know? They just slip through our fingers. Like so many people, places, things that happened, relationships and so on in the past, I can remember them, but where are they now? They're gone. It's just like they never happened. They don't leave any trace except perhaps a memory. You know, but people become attached even to their memories. <laughs> so uh, the lesson here is that if we want to see the world as it is, we have to be prepared to look without expectation. I know, I know, we've all heard millions of times stories that the world is real and what goes around comes around and, you know, all this stuff. And that is true as long as we're looking at the world from a viewpoint of duality. But when we move beyond duality, when we reach Brahman, when we reach self-realization, then we see differently. You know, yeah, there's a world there, but it's more like a mirage. There's no there there. You know, there's no real existence there because real existence is permanent. It's without suffering. And it is the self. See, so unless it has these attributes, it's not real. Like Richard likes to say, every time I check, I find out that I exist. You know, but every time you check, you don't find other things exist. They come and go. So the thing that is real is that which persists, that never goes away. And that is the self with a capital S. Brahman, or the this is the ground of being, and this is the source of creation. Because it's just by looking, drishti, that we create the world, srishti. So this is uh, how the Advaitin sees. And it's interesting, you know, if you if you look at the Buddha's teaching. He's, he is sometimes mistaken for an atheist or even a nihilist because he says there's no God, creation just happens. There is no soul of the universe or anything like that. You know, and and uh, people who are in duality think, oh, this is really atheistic or, or nihilistic. But actually it's not so. Because the Buddha has that same realization that this world comes into being when I see it, when I go looking for it. He says, since a long time, I have lived in a dwelling made of emptiness. What does that mean? That means his default consciousness is emptiness. Now, emptiness is not nothing. Emptiness is actually the same thing as we call Brahman or self or, you know, the reality. Just that the Buddha expresses it in different terms. 
different language, a different form of reasoning. So he doesn't compromise. If somebody asks him about God, he says, well, you know, that God might appear, but really there is no God. He has such great compassion that he doesn't compromise with our sentimentality and our illusion. But he tells it right like it is from the place where he is at. Uh, this is great integrity. You know, um, about four years back, I felt compelled to add the tantric teachings of Sri Vidya to the channel because so many people were showing up who are not qualified for the Advaita view. You know, I had gone through so many years of sadhana in different modalities, different cultures, different teachings, and so on. And uh, because of that, it, it made my attainment of Advaita very easy. But most people don't have that background. Most people don't have such good fortune. So the way they acquire that good fortune is by karma yoga and bhakti yoga. So I added those teachings to the channel, teachings on Sri Vidya about the goddess and like that, which are very beneficial for material life, for life in duality, for um, improving one's karma and bringing good results, good fortune, which is called in India punya. So, uh, by doing these rituals and so on, by offering prayers and mantras and so on, um, one gets these benefits. And within the purview of duality, this is completely real. But as soon as you go beyond duality to non-duality, you see that the whole thing is, is just an illusion. It could be a pleasant or an unpleasant illusion. To someone who's really beyond duality, it doesn't matter because it's all just a movie. But for those who are still thinking that they are these uh, characters in the movie, it's really helpful to have a means of improving your karma and getting the benefits of a religious life. So that's why this teaching, this Dharmasar teaching, encompasses all these different stage, stages. And um, I'm looking for a way to make this more accessible to people so that they understand the structure of this teaching and they don't get overwhelmed or confused by the fact that we jump back and forth seamlessly between the Vedas and the Buddha and between bhakti yoga and karma yoga and jnana yoga and raj yoga, you know, uh, because we've been there, we've done that. And, you know, we're familiar, intimately familiar with all these paths. I know most people aren't. So it's a bit confusing, oh, but we're working on it, okay? I think uh, what I'm going to do is come up with a an iOS app uh, that, that takes you through this explanation um, in a structured way. It's really hard to do in just a video. So that's what I have to say for today. <laughs> Good, it's time now for questions and discussion. Swamiji, I came here to ask about the Sri Vidya. I went through last night. I, you described the Nyasas there and your printout. And then I was doing the Mantrika. Which one should I start first? The mantra? You should mantra. start with the Siddhi Mantra. Mm -hmm. 
Siddhi Mantra. Um, that's in the uh, series on Mahashodashi Mantra. Yes, I went through that too. I saw that. I saw the niyasas all described. You know, all the niyasas and all that. I, I'm having... I'm having trouble hearing. There's some noise on the line. Can you mute everybody? It's not because it's Chinese New Year coming on Monday. So there's oh. A lot of oh, I, I put on the earphone. It's Chinese New Year on Tuesday. So, so in Malaysia, we, we have Chinese, we have Indians, we have, we have a lot of nationalities. So, we so you, you get the... You get the fireworks all the time then for Diwali and everything. <laughs> okay. So anyway, okay. If you go to the Maha Sodashi series, in the beginning, there's one episode on Siddhi Mantra. And that includes instructions how to contact Santosh. Santosh is the Siddhi Mantra guru. Mm. That's because the um, Atma Bija is derived astrologically, and he knows how to do that. He's got a lot of experience. I mean, I know it theoretically, but he's got a lot of experience doing it. And you have to get the right Atma Bija. It's very important. Mm. And then you can move on to the Bala Mantra, and then to the Mahashodashi Mantra. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you go through any of these scriptures, Lakshmi Tantra, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, or you know, any of the uh, tantras on uh, goddess worship, there's so many mantras, you know? I mean, just pick one and go with it. <laughs> I'm because uh, they're all good. Yes, I'm uh, reading the Matrika and I find it very interesting because of these uh, Sanskrit syllables and then um, the SO rhyme and it actually vibrates the body. But after, after I think about nine days, I, I'm feeling sick. <laughs> Well, what will happen if you do the nyasa, the matrika nyasa? It's going to open up all the nadis. Mm. There's 16,000 nadis or energy centers in the body. The seven chakras are only the main ones. So that because each syllable or each uh, letter in the matrika Ang, um, ang, um, ing, ing, um, um, ring, ring, and so on. Those activate specific centers or groups of centers. So um, doing the matrika nyasa, you're, you're doing ordinary nyasa first, right? Where you touch the fingertips and chant mantras. I, I did not do the niyasa yet because I'm not sure. But by uh, the 10th day, I felt very sick. I started on the 19th. By yesterday, I felt very sick. I couldn't do the mantra. <laughs> very, very sick. Well, stop. Stop. Um, it means the purification is going too fast. Oh. <laughs> and you know, and I'm yeah. not sure. Last night. You should take one mantra and just stick with that for a long time. You take any mantra that you find attractive, you know, any form of the goddess or of God, or whatever, and just stick with that for some time. Um, from the moment you wake up until you go to sleep at night. Chant that one mantra and don't skip around too much. Just find one that you like. It's, it's, I'm not going to say it's arbitrary. It has to be something that appeals to you, that interests you. 
and just practice that one mantra for a long time. Counting on beads, the mala, is very good because it engages the yeah it engages the senses of sense of touch like that so and a chanting aloud in the beginning is also good but after a while you're going to wind up chanting mentally because the mind then will become will go into the rhythm of the chant of the mantra and the, the rhythm is very important, by the way. That, that could be one problem. Um, I tell you what, you pick a mantra and then you contact me and I'll give you the correct pronunciation. I contact you through, how do I contact you besides me in the public comment? Uh, by email or by signal? I don't have your email, Swamiji. Because uh, I... it's on the site. It's it's on the sorry on the YouTube channel, on the on the channel page, and the about tab. There's a button that says show email. Okay, I'll look at that. But it, my email is simple. It's dharmasar at gmail.com. Hmm. Because even last night I had a dream of doing massive cleaning in the house. I said, there's a lot of cleansing. Eh? <laughs> Clean house, yes. Yeah. Clean that house. The whole house was so messy. I had to clean all the bathroom. I think there was... <laughs> Because when I was doing the four foundation of the Tibetan Buddhism, when I went through with the uh, Vajrasattva mantra, first round is I had a lot of diarrhea. Second round, I had dreams of going to the toilet. And then when we go to the uh, mandala, I have a lot of dreams of eating. So last night I said, I, I'm, I was falling very sick. That's why I, was, I came. I'm here to ask what am I to do? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you might be trying to go too fast. Because at one time I chanted three times a day and the rhythm was very nice. But later I fell sick. <laughs> oh. Well, I think you should also not only chant, but then, but study too. Studying is cooling to the mind. Yeah, I, I had the Shodasi initiation in 2014, the mantra. Uh, from Swami Nityananda. So I said, I want to go into something. He, he is my, my guru because I learn a lot. I have a lot of changes, but I thought I want to go into something specific to learn because uh, from, Swami, from Swami Ji U, I learned a lot of Puranas, which I did not learn last, night, last time. I learned a lot about the Sridi, the Sh all, all the other things, all the Rupas, and a lot of Sanskrit from you by listening. <laughs> so I'm I'm building up a lot of the sastra and the sutra background, which I don't have. Uh, the Veda background, which I don't have. I came from a Buddhist background, so there were many gaps. So I want to go back to sastra pramana pr 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 because there are a lot of teachings on the uh, apta pramana, on the atma pramana, and the shakshi pramana, and the pr prediction pramana. But I don't have the background. So from your channel, I go and learn the sastras and all. Yeah, the, background is very important. All the puranas. When I went through the Lalita Tantra, mm -hmm. I understand the creation. So I I say, oh, now I understand what people were talking of through the Atma and the Atma uh, Pramana, I said, I, I don't know. But what I, what I, Shakshi, what I experience is, why, why is it like this? Because I have a questioning mind. So I went back, I said, oh yeah, that's how it works. 
you know, studying the background is very important. The context, context yes. creates meaning. So the more context you have, then the more you will uh, understand the meaning. If somebody else has their hand up. Who is that? I actually want to ask you talk about emptiness, Sunyata. Do we relate it to the Akasha, Akash space? Um, not really. Not really. Akash is only um, space. Mm -hmm. It's not emptiness. Space is still a material element. So um, in space, there is always the possibility of becoming. But in emptiness, there is no becoming. The equivalent teaching in the Sri Vidya is Bindu. Bindu is a dimensionless dot. So it has no dimension. That means it's measureless, timeless, spaceless. There's no change, no motion, no transformation, no creation, no becoming. What to speak of actions and reactions and so on. So no, they're not the same thing, not at all. It's, Akasha is a, a step on the way. Yeah, it's the most subtle material element, but it's still a material element. It's still part of duality. Every night I go through the tantras because I feel it's a massive work to read through them and to listen. You have done so much work on it. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> now we're getting to the last few minutes. So, uh, already? Already. So, if there are more <laughs> questions or comments, we haven't heard today from Kumar or Evelyn. So if you want to dialogue with Swamiji, unmute yourself and join us. Thanks for reminding me to <clears throat> unmute myself. Um, when, you were, when you were speaking of, about um, just being where, where we are and not uh, fantasizing that we're further down the road, so to speak. Um, that feels good to me. Uh, I'm right at the crux of, uh, you know, uh, catching on that that's just a play. It's a movie. And yet, I will enter in and then I'll, I'll go oh don't touch that uh, um, it's just something that seems to have to dawn uh, little pieces like uh, you know this whole body construct and the mind is all in the movie because it's observable. But I will say one thing personally, uh, and I've thought about this quite a bit, there is such a powerful instinct in this woman who's been a mother. That's the one that wants to reach out and and it concerns getting my dogs to Mexico. 
I want to be the doer of that. Just mm. get out of my way, God. I, I'm going to take care of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I see it. I see that I'm doing that. And I'm like, well, Evan, would you like to own the whole universe and direct it? Or would you just like to leave it alone? Because really, there is no middle road. <laughs> so that's where, that's where, I, where I am, catching myself going where there's <laughs> no future in that. <laughs> yeah, it's just a dawning, like, okay. This is beginning. It's just a shift. It's what that is. I love the story of the Buddha's enlightenment. He was sitting under the bow tree and watching the sunrise. He had been up all night meditating and contemplating. And um, he was watching Venus as the morning star rising before the sun. And, you know, Venus is very beautiful and pure. Yeah. And then as he watched, Venus slowly faded out. And there was no moment when he mm. could say, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The whole thing happened so gradually and smoothly. And uh, this is reflected in a lot of his suttas, his talks, where when he talks about the process of self-realization, he says, and with the fading out of mm -hmm. this or that. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. So it's mm -hmm. like that. Yes. Fading out of the ego, fading out of desire, fading out of uh, wanting to be the controller or whatever, cannot, it's not something we can do. Because as soon as we become the doer, then we're in the driver's seat again. We're the yeah. controller. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's... This is a beautiful example of non-doing. I love that poem by Basho. Sitting here, doing nothing. And the spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. Yes. Yeah. Right. So in one sense, there is nothing we can do. Our, our fortune... Our destiny, our karma is already determined, yeah. at least for this lifetime. So, you know, ride with it, roll with it, uh, allow it to happen, <clears throat> get yeah. out of its way. And yeah. that doesn't preclude getting stuff done. Right. But to get stuff done with detachment and yeah. not be invested that my plan, you know, will work <laughs> and all this. Uh, but, yeah. you know, make, make a good uh, try, make a good effort and see what happens, right? And if you try two or three times and it doesn't happen, well, maybe it's time to back off a little bit and try something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like I was saying, to, to take it easy, and not to try to force things, because then if you become the doer, you're responsible. That's right. You know, that's right. And yeah. you're going to have to take the the, car, the consequences. Yeah. Yeah. I let go of that all, I don't know, many times. Like, oh, don't touch that. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> So yeah, you can't you can't force the grass to grow in the spring. No, no, and it for has me, to happen. Yes, and it's like the it's a fruit that ripens in its own time. It doesn't just suddenly go from, you know, hard green old thing to 
you know, something dropping off off the tree. Uh, and I think pro- some of the problem is, is all the stuff you hear, I th- and I think I don't just speak for myself, but, you know, I had this sudden awakening and suddenly my ego just dropped off and everything kind of exploded. And, you know, there's been a lot of feeding of that. And that, it's, a, it's a, not helpful for me. I've got to that just, can happen. Yes. But it's usually temporary. Yes. Yes, I agree with that. Um, but uh, I, I like... I like your help with the fact that things, you know, to relax and allow things to happen as they're bound to happen, really. The really important things just happen. Yes, that's they're true. Bl- they're blessings. There's, they're not something you can control or force yeah. or make happen. That's uh, right. They just drop out of the sky on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Them were nice. Some of them were kind of like bird poop, but <laughs> drop out of the sky. <laughs> but, well, but who are know. we to judge? That's right. Yeah. It, just, yeah. it might seem like, you know, from the egoic point of view, it might seem like uh, a particular lesson is really intensely disrespectful to us, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but then you look back on it later and it's like, oh boy, I really needed that. Yes, that's that's true. I, I completely agree with that. And that's been my experience. Things that were very difficult and I hated it and I fought it. And then down the road with an understanding that that's, that had to happen and that only goodness came from it, actually. So... Thank Saturn you. can can be a tough teacher. Yeah. Uh, now we're coming close to the end of the hour. Uh, Nicholas just joined us, and I just thought if you're willing, Swami G, we could give Nicholas or Kumar a chance to uh, speak in dialogue if they want. How about hearing from either of you? Unmute yourself and take this chance. I just wanted to uh, share my gratitude for all the pointers that were shared today. Actually, I had come with a question that if Vedanta is the supreme knowledge, like is Sri Vidya necessary? And you just answered without asking so. <laughs> well, we're in tune. Yeah. I'm here for Sri Vidya too. <laughs> and it looks like Nicholas has unmuted himself. Namaste. How is everyone? Good. Yeah, um, I don't have any dialogue right now. Uh, it'll come to me uh, later. But as of right now, I really don't have anything to add. Well, I, I do. I want to thank Nicholas for his very kind donation for some astrology software. Uh, the the very state least of the know. art. Very least. Uh, it's really wonderful because, you know, uh, because of the banking restrictions in India and Sri Lanka, I can't pay for it from here. So, mm. you know, if I, yeah, I have the money, but I, I can't make the payment. So thank you very much for purchasing that upgrade. No problem That'll at make all. Possible, make it possible to help a lot of people. My pleasure. So uh, I think we should wrap it up for today then. And again, thank you very much, Swamiji, for uh, this sharing. And we'll meet next time at the same time. Same time, same station. It always goes by so fast. Yes. And again, uh, for me, it is wonderful to have all of you join us. And I look forward to it again next time. So thank you. Oh, 
तत्सत् ओम शक्ति ही ओम